high school yearbook. I wonder. Oh, I wonder. Let's see. Oh, the year is right. Boy, I'm tired of winter. Me too. We've all had cold. Can't play outdoor sports. Every time we want to go out, we have to get all wrapped up. Where's the sun? It's winter. It's farther away. No, it's nearer. Right. It's nearer to us in the winter than in the summer. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. If it were nearer, it would be hotter. I can't explain it. I just know that the sun is nearer to the earth in the winter than in the summer. I read it somewhere. Prove it. How? Well, we could bring the sun in here and ask it. I don't think that's the practical truth. Look, I know how to settle this. Where are you going? I've got an idea. Without the sun, there wouldn't be any life at all on Earth. You and I wouldn't be here at all. Thanks, son. Mm. Mm. Dr. Eddy, you're a solar astronomer, so you're the only one I know who can settle this. Now, Mark says that the sun can't be closer to us in winter. Because if it were closer, we'd be warmer. But I read somewhere that the sun is closer to us in the winter. First of all, <laughs> call me Jack. Oh, Secondly, yeah. Lisa, you're right. We are slightly closer to the sun in the winter. And you would think that would make it warmer. But that's not nearly so important as another fact. The fact that the Earth is not flat, but it's a ball, a sphere, like this basketball. And how much sunlight we receive depends upon where we are on the surface of this ball, whether we're at the top or near the equator. Now the Earth, this ball in space, has a tilt to it as it makes its path of motion around the sun. That means that during one part of the year, the sun's rays strike it more directly. Six months later, that same tilt causes it that the sunlight strikes it at more of a glancing blow and it's cooler. To us, on the surface of the ball, it means that the sun is higher in the sky in the summer than it is in the winter. That produces the season and causes the times of hot and cold. I think it's also the reason why man has always worshipped the sun and why it has seemed so important to him. Well, Jack, what did these people think when there was an eclipse of the sun? They were very frightened, Trini, just as you would be if this star that you worship, this perfect fire, as it moved across the sky in the course of the day, slowly got darkened, slowly blackened, until it went out altogether, and the stars came out. That would be a frightening sight. Eclipses occur because the moon in its path of motion around the Earth at times comes exactly between the Earth and the sun, so that they're all in a line, sun, moon, and Earth. At those times, as we look toward the sun, the moon blocks the sun completely, and we can't see it. That's an eclipse of the sun, or a solar eclipse. At other times, the three can be lined up so that the Earth is exactly between the moon and the sun. This creates an eclipse of the moon in the same way. Astronomers like solar eclipses because they give us a chance to study parts of the sun that we can't see at other times. The outer atmosphere of the sun where much of the action occurs, all these explosions, all the high temperature things that occur in the red chromosphere and the white wispy corona around it and the region of transition in between. It's in these layers that so many explosions, flares, high prominences on the sun occur. We think about the sun as just a white fire in the sky, but it's really a very active star where there are lots of action. You know, it seems weird to me that those flares seem to be haphazard. 
Sometimes they're gigantic and sometimes they're really small. Wouldn't that affect the temperature of the Earth? We would think it would, Mark, but we don't really know whether those changes on the sun are causing the climate to change or not. What we do know is that the climate of the Earth is changing and has changed a great deal in the past. Oh. The, the last and best example that I can describe to you are the major ice ages, the last of which began about 20,000 years ago and ended maybe about 10,000 years ago. During that time, the surface of the Earth was really affected by this climate change. The Earth got cooler by perhaps 10 degrees over its surface. That made the ice creep down from the north, covering almost all of Canada, reaching down into the United States as far as Chicago or New York, with a blanket of ice a mile thick, pushing down on the surface of the Earth. Then it gradually retreated. Since that time, we've had other climate excursions, the last of which was a mini ice age, and that wasn't long ago. Really? How long ago? It started about the time of Columbus, or Shakespeare, and ended in the middle of the last century, in the 1800s. During that time, the Earth was much cooler than it is today, although not as cold as during a major ice age. But it was cold enough that during this time, we read curiously of the Spanish conquistadors in New Mexico telling us about walking their horses across a frozen Rio Grande at Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And that's well, hard to believe. Yeah. What's the difference between those two different periods of time? It's in the how much the temperature changes, Mark. About 10 degrees change for a major ice age, one or two degrees change for a mini ice age. But both of them are severe, and they would affect us a great deal. Well, Jack, what would happen to us if we had a major ice age now? We would learn to adjust to it. And some of us who live in the northern latitudes would have to learn to live, say, more like Eskimos, who have learned how to live with cold by insulating their bodies better than we do. These are the Netsalik Eskimos, who live above the Arctic Circle. The temperature is often colder than 10 below zero Fahrenheit. the community works together to build an igloo. The device makes a perfect window. Seal oil provides heat for the Netsalik. The name Netsalik means people of the seal. And the door of snow keeps out the icy winds for the night. entering a new ice age, Jack? Would you really like to know the truth, Mark? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I think it's inevitable that a major ice age is coming, and I mean one like the ones where, can't, where ice covered so much of Canada. How soon is that going to be? And that's the important part of the question, and a good question to ask. And the answer is not soon at all. It, from the past record of climate, as we see how these things recur, it says that one should be setting upon us within the next several thousand years. But, but doesn't an ice age happen overnight? It seems to when you look at the course of, say, geological time. But it, in fact, it takes uh, tens or hundreds of years for it to set in so slowly that any one generation in the past probably wouldn't have noticed the onset of an ice age. 
they come upon us in kind of a sneaky way in that regard. How would you adapt to a temperature change like that? It might not be so bad for many of us. If you lived in the tropical latitudes, let's say in Florida, an ice age might not be such a bad thing at all. If you lived in the northern latitudes, then you'd have to adjust to longer winters and shorter summers, or maybe no summers at all. Aww. But you'd have to do that by adjusting to the kind of way you insulated your house and the sort of clothing that you wore. Oh, I know about that. It's like what you have to do when you go mountain climbing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How cold is it up there? Well, at night it'll go down below freezing. You know, on a day like today, it'll get above freezing a little. A lot of people go in the mountains with blue jeans on, and it's the worst possible thing to do, because when cotton gets wet, it has very little insulating value. It's, just, it's wet and it, get cold. Worse than that, the water, it, it, the water freezes and it wicks heat off your body. As the water evaporates, or as the wind blows and evaporates, it, it cools you off, which is just what you don't want. And wool is the, almost the perfect material for the mountains, because even when it gets wet, it continues to insulate. Very few materials do that. All right, huh? Good. X. One left. Uh, All right. Let you get a load off there. No more. Hmm? You want to take it off? Yeah. yeah. I got your vest here, huh? Take it. This vest, for example, is probably filled with down. Mm -hmm. and down is wonderful so long as it's dry, but when it's wet, it's almost worthless. A lot of times you hear people dying of exposure. You know, you hear these things on the news. What usually happens is they get wet. They don't freeze to death. They get wet, and then their body temperature goes down, and they go into well, what what's is called hypothermia. Yeah, I'll put this on. Earth isn't the only place people need to insulate themselves. Lisa, remember Vicki Johnson? Let's climb in here. Vicki Johnson. Hey, are you an astronaut? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you look like one. You sure oh. do. No, I'm an engineer with Hamilton Standard, the company that makes the life support system for the shuttle spacecraft. Oh, wow. How does that suit help the astronaut? Well, it supplies oxygen and uh, removes carbon dioxide out of the air when the astronaut breathes. It provides a pressurized environment for the astronaut, provides communication through the vehicle. And it uh, has its own battery source, so that has its own power. Mm -hmm. And it provides cooling water. Does this suit have a heater? No, you never need a heater because it's so well insulated that the astronaut always needs to be cool. Your body heat is kept all inside, so very quickly the inside of the suit gets up to 98.6 degrees and more. Yeah. So there's, I have a, a pair of long underwear on, and there's little tubes all in it, and there's water that flows through the tubes and into the backpack. And the backpack has a uh, refrigerator in it and <laughs> cools that water and it just recirculates and keeps me cool. So it's the water that's cooling your body off? That's right. Jack, Vicki said that uh, the visor on the astronaut's spacesuit helps protect them from the heat of the sun. Well, what really happens when something gets hot? Leaves, remember? We talked about that the other day. Yeah. Oh, your famous jumping molecules? You got it. It says here that molecules are in constant motion. When you heat something up, you make the molecules in it move around faster and bang into each other harder. Speaking of molecules crashing around. What do you mean? Well, I put cold water in here, and the molecules were moving around. And then you put it on the fire. Right. And they started moving faster and banging into each other harder and harder. Some of them flew up into the air inside of here. You mean steam. You got it. And they started escaping through the only exit, the whistle. OK, so I understand what happens to the molecules when the water gets hot. But what I still Drink mean... Drink your tea. I don't like tea, more, Except iced tea in the summer. I don't think this is good for you, but okay, I'll put ice in it. Hey, what about ice? What about it? Well, what's happening with the molecules in ice? Not too much. The ice is so cold, the molecules are hardly moving at all. Hey, he's right. Everything looks like it's at a standstill, all gathered together. That's why you can pick it up like this, right? Mm-hmm. Ice is stiff water. You know, I never thought of it that way. There you go. Okay, but what about the molecules in air? Same thing. You heat them up and they fly around faster and harder. That's hard to visualize. Yeah. Let me see if I can explain it to you. Excuse me. All right. Pretend it's popcorn or air molecules. OK. Mm -hmm. Now, if you heat up the air, the molecules start moving around faster and banging into each other and against the sides of the container. So it's like the water molecules in the kettle. Right. 
the warmer the air gets, the faster they start moving around, and the more crashing around they do. <laughs> Some of your molecules are escaping. Right. We have the same amount of space, but it's filled with less stuff. Yeah? Well, then it's probably lighter than air that hasn't been heated up. Bingo. Have a molecule. <laughs> okay. But what can we use this information for? I mean, is it useful for anything that we care about? Well, let's see. Things that are lighter than other things tend to float up, right? Turn the burner on now. Joyce, how big is the balloon? It's seven stories high, 55 feet in diameter. Wait off the balloon. Everybody let go. Why, with the whole universe out there, did you decide to pick the sun to study? I think in part, Mark, because it's so important to us. It is only a star, only one among millions. Middle-sized, middle-class, middle-aged, but it's the one star on which we completely and utterly depend, for we depend upon the sun for almost everything we have, for light and heat, but also for all the food that we eat comes to us through the energy of sunlight as well. Almost all forms of energy come from the sun. All forms? Well, now I can see where the wood we burn comes from the sun. I mean, we couldn't grow trees without the sun. But what about things like oil and gasoline? They also come from sunlight, as does the energy that we get in wind power or water power, for it's sunlight that causes the wind to blow and that lifts the water from the oceans to the air and makes it fall back again. As for these other forms, they are fossil fuel, petroleum and coal, they're here because sunlight fell upon the earth way in the past, causing this vegetation to grow that's now decayed. So in using coal and petroleum, we're only harvesting the sunlight that fell upon the earth in ages past. We use it today in modern ways as burning an internal combustion engine. Of. You remember when I had the gas tank, when I poured the gasoline in the gas tank? Mm -hmm. Well, the gas tank would be above here, and then the gasoline came in that gas line I showed you and went into the carburetor. The carburetor mixes the air and the gasoline together and makes a vapor. That's what the carburetor is for. So the air came in behind the cover I showed you, the gasoline came down, became a vapor, and comes down into the cylinder. When the gasoline gets into the cylinder, the piston comes up and compresses it. And then the spark, the spark plug makes a spark in here. The spark comes from the spark plug and causes an explosion, which pushes the piston down. When the piston goes down, 
it turns this crank, and the crank turns this gear, which is connected to the chain, which is connected to the back wheel. The back wheel goes around and the bike moves. So then, what happened to all the fuel in there after the explosion? After the explosion, the leftover fuel is like, there's an explosion, it's like a fire, there's like smoke. That's the exhaust. The exhaust is left and you want to get that out of the cylinder. So that escapes out a little hole down here and goes out the exhaust pipe and out the back of the bike. So Jack, when we talk about solar energy, we're really talking about almost all energy, right? Yes, but what people usually mean when they speak of solar energy is using the heat of the sun directly or converting sunlight into electrical energy. This is Michael Hope. His father, Charles, has invented a device that uses the sun and wind to make electricity. Okay. Yeah, your father's been trying to explain this thing. I'm still not too sure about it, so uh, why don't you see if you can do it? All right. You understand it, right? Of course I do. Okay. How old are you? Well, you understand it, Alan. Okay. Over here, right here, is the reflector. And this is the heat exchanger speaking up the black. And they reflect the sun's rays into the... What kind of gas again? That's freon gas. That's yeah. Yeah, freon gas. And from there, they go under here and down these tubes. They go into here, into the... Uh, Turbine. Turbine. Right. Mark, here's a schematic of our entire turbine drive system using the sun's energy pushing it through this heat exchanger gas to move this turbine and drive this generator, which delivers your power. The turbine spins the generator that produces electricity. So the electricity generated here goes into our homes, right? Now, what about this part down here. You have water going in there also? Water is shot in here. It goes out there. Cool off the gas, so it can go off again to be used again up here. But to make a lot of electricity, you need a much larger system. At Sandia Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I saw how this power tower uses mirrors to capture the sun's energy. Cheryl, what are all these mirrors used for? Well, these mirrors are used to generate electricity. Huh? Do they have a name? They're called than... heliostats. What do you do with them? We aim all of these mirrors up to a focus point on that tall tower you see over there. You aim them up here? Mm -hmm. On the very top of the tower, see the white skinny thing with the black strip right in the center? Uh huh. We shine all the light from every one of these mirrors up to that point. So what happens after you've gotten all the light up there? Up there, we have water flowing through some tubes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the heat from the sun keeps, keeps up the water in the tubes. Right. And then what happens? And we get very hot steam. Mm -hmm. Which helps you to produce electricity. That's right. Do you know how hot it gets up there? It could get to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Really? You know, Jack, you've really changed my attitude towards the sun. I never really appreciated it. Me too. I never thought about it, but we're all dependent on that one star for energy and for all our food. Yeah, we get a lot more from the sun than the tan. Miami for the winter, Woody. Oh, 
Oh, I'll be glad when you discover fire so we can heat ourselves with something besides that big ball up there. And great, 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 great grandmother dejectedly didn't have it much easier. Whoa. Okay. Well, we finally got fire. It's such a secure feeling to know we don't have to depend on the sun for warmth anymore. Where do you think this wood comes from? Wood City? It comes from trees. Trees can't grow without sun. No sun, no trees, no trees, no wood, no wood, no fire, no fire. <clears throat> Out in the cold again. You know, burning this coal is a lot better than the wood. Yeah, but I'm not sure we shouldn't put an oil burner in. Like Darby and Joan next door. Oh, I don't care. After all, none of us has to depend on that dumb sun for warmth anymore. Coal and oil come from decayed plants and animals, my lovely. So? Without the sun, we, we got, got no, no plants. plants. No plants, no coal, no oil, no heat. Yes, sir, Ralph. Our ancestors had it rough having to depend on the sun for warmth. Uh-huh, they sure did. I'm sure glad we outsmarted the old sun. What's on the roof, Fidel? Our solar heat panels. They heat our house and our water. Outsmarted, yeah. Oh, come on, Sandy, cheer up. <laughs> The winter will be over soon, and we want to go to the beach and have a wonderful time. If you went swimming now, your fur would turn into icicles. So let's wait for the sun, okay? Okay. Oh, I've really enjoyed visiting with you, but I think it's time I must be going. Oh, that's too bad. Thanks for coming. We learned a lot. Oh, yeah, I enjoyed time. it, too. Yeah. Well, I'll walk out with you. i got to be okay. getting home anyhow. Oh, and before I leave, here's a little present to remember me by. You didn't have to see that, Jack. Thanks. Yeah, we're glad you did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a radio. Thanks. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's really nice. I don't think it works, though. Take it out under my favorite star, and it'll work for you. A solar powered radio? Oh, oh, that's wow. great! Really nice. Oh, wow. I can't believe you did that. Yes, I am. Okay. Hey, listen, it's really nice to meet you. Nice meeting you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Bye, Trina. Bye. Thanks for coming. Hey, I can't wait for the summer when the sun's a little further away from us. Right. <laughs> Whenever there's trouble, we'll be on the double with a bloodhound gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with a bloodhound gang. Be sure to watch next time when 3 to one Contact brings you the exciting adventures of the Bloodhound Gang. 3 to one Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. It's a game show. It's a geography lesson. It's a mystery. It's the search for Carmen Sandiego, and it continues today at 4.30. Now, stick around for Square One TV.